So our next speaker is Dr. Felipe Terran. Uh, he's an emergency physician and investigator at Will Cornell Medicine in New York City. He completed a fellowship in emergency ultrasonography at Mount Sinai Hospital, a Master of Science in Clinical Epidemiology at the University of Pennsylvania, and he's a test member of the National Board of Echocardiography Critical Care Echocardiography Examination. As a translational research scientist and resuscitation scientist, his research aims to investigate novel resuscitation strategies in both laboratory and clinical environments with a primary interest in novel strategies to improve cardiopulmonary resuscitation, including the use of transesophageal echocardiography. He's the founder of the Resuscitative TEE Project and principal investigator of the multi-center TEE collaborative, collaborative registry, aimed to accelerate the development of outcome-oriented research and knowledge translation on the use of TEE in emergency and critical care settings. Without further ado, Dr. Philippe Turan. Hello, I am Felipe Tran. I'm an emergency physician and researcher in the Department of Emergency Medicine at Weill Cornell Medicine in New York City. It is my honor to join the Congress and present on the topic of resuscitative TE during cardiac arrest. I am a founder and course director for the resuscitative TE workshop, and I'm also a consultant for Fujifilm Sonocide. When we talk about resuscitative TE in emergency medicine or in critical care, there are a number of other related concepts that are often used that um, more or less uh, aim at describing the same thing. So rescue TE is more uh, commonly, I think, the term used in the anesthesia literature. Focus TE or point of care TE are other terms that are uh, also used to describe this modality uh, and the scope of this modality in uh, emergency and critical care settings. But regardless of what term we use, um, fundamentally what we're describing here is the application of transesophageal echo at the point of care in order to obtain real-time data that will impact decision-making at the bedside. It is always emergent or urgent and uh, for the most part is going to be performed in intubated patients. So this is different from comprehensive perioperative transesophageal echo or comprehensive consultative uh, transesophageal echo performed by our cardiology colleagues. So this is in the hands of, cardio uh, of either emergency physicians or intensivists or cardiologists or anybody uh, with the right uh, level of training to apply this modality. But specifically, what I'm going to describe today is the application of uh, TE in cardiac arrest. And so it is really not about the number of views uh, when we refer to resuscitative uh, or rescue or focus TE. <clears throat> it could be a four-view protocol, six-view protocol, it could be 12 views. Um, it is really about um, the questions that we're asking and the uh, uh, the uh, clinical information that we can uh, obtain and that we can impact. This is, um, from my perspective, the three groups of applications that um, today we we conceive in this landscape of resuscitative uh, TE. And, and this is, as you can see on the right hand, um, is really across uh, the acute care environment. So no matter whether it's in the emergency department, in the uh, OR, ICU, CCU, it is going to be the same patient that can have any of these clinical conditions. And it's in these conditions where, whether because transthoracic is not able to provide the information that we need or because simply transesophageal echo represents a better uh, tool for that job. Um, that is uh, why we're going to be using uh, TE for these uh, different clinical applications. And cardiac arrest is the one that I've been studying for uh, the past uh, several years. And it is uh, a, a unique application in that um, TE represents uh, really uh, a, a new um, 
a, a number of new opportunities uh, in terms of understanding uh, the disease, in terms of understanding CPR physiology, um, and uh, also potentially intervening, optimizing, improving um, doing uh, CPR specifically. So this is an example, this is a picture of our team expecting a patient with out of hospital cardiac arrest. Um, everything is set up, uh, as you can see at the, at, the bed, at the foot of the bed, we have a clinician already gowned up, ready to uh, help with procedures. We have our nurses. We have a physician at the head of the bed here, uh, ready to uh, intubate, to confirm uh, airway, uh, advanced airway placement. And um, that physician is also going to perform uh, the intra-arrest uh, transesophageal echo. So before I tell you more specifically, um, what is it that uh, T can help us with in uh, cardiac arrest today, um, I want to take you uh, through a very brief history of uh, how we got here. What is uh, this, th this modality? Um, where was this modality used and how? And it actually goes back to 1993, where this modality was first described uh, actually by a group of cardiologists, Dr. Dr. Rita Riedberg, at the time, I believe, at UC University of San, um, UCSF in San Francisco, um, with her colleagues did the study evaluating um, the use of TE as a mean, as a, as a tool to understand CPR physiology and specifically direction of blood flow. And so it was this study actually, uh, along with uh, another couple of similar studies uh, performed in the 90s, that actually uh, provided us with uh, the, the current understanding we have of CPR physiology and specifically the cardiac pump theory. That is how CPR actually works, how close chest CPR actually works, um, documenting what the valves were doing during this compression, uh, uh, during the compression and decompression phase, the mitral valve um, being closed during the compression phase and the aortic valve being open represented the, the key findings that define this, uh, this theory that establishes um, that the way uh, that we generate forward flow during chest compressions is by directly compressing uh, the left ventricle, ejecting uh, fluid into the aorta. So fast forward, um, it was in 2019 that our group following the, the work of, of others um, in, in the years prior, uh, performed the first study actually evaluating systematically cardiac arrest patients with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest um, as a diagnostic tool, uh, but also a, as a tool to evaluate uh, CPR physiology and identify what later has become um, to be a common phenomenon in cardiac arrest, which is specifically the abstraction of the left ventricle alpha tract doing uh, CPR. So I want to uh, describe why is it that uh, this can be helpful? Why to perform, what should we consider performing resuscitative or focused T in, in cardiac arrest? Well, I think the first argument here is that transophageal echo is simply the right tool for the job. It is the best tool we have to evaluate um, the patient's heart in real time, unlike transthoracic, uh, we don't have to uh, rely on interrupting chest compressions in order to evaluate uh, the patient's heart, heart's function, um, characterize uh, the, the type of cardiac arrest that we have, the rhythm, and identify if we have a reversible cause. But really what makes unique, uh, trans, what, what makes transophageal echo unique is its ability to perform not just a snapshot uh, of information doing uh, the resuscitation, but rather continuous imaging. So serial reassessments, uh, in the case of cardiac arrest, continuous imaging uh, during the resuscitation. And uh, a reason why this has become so um, relevant in uh, the, the, the context of CPR specifically is because we have learned that the ability to look at the heart while we are delivering CPR is an ideal opportunity for us to actually appreciate in real time whether what we're doing, what we're intending to do, that is compressing the left ventricle in order to eject blow of blood and, and generate forward flow, 
whether that is actually happening or not um, in, concord, in accordance with the cardiac pump theory. So this is, for instance, an example of a patient uh, in the early phase of the resuscitation of an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. You can see here a mid-esophageal long axis view in those ongoing chest compressions uh, with a mechanical compression device. As you can see, while the compressions are happening, you see a little bit of, um, uh, of, of activity here of compression, of shortening of the diameter of that left ventricle, but it's very, very minimal. And there's very minimal opening of the aortic valve uh, with also very obviously low velocities. You can see smoke sign, uh, it's essentially blood uh, really not really moving much uh, in that left ventricle or out of it. Um, so uh, in accordance or in, in, in uh, concordance with that, the entitled CO2 at that point was 11. And so this is um, in case that um, somebody might not be aware, entitled CO2 represents the best surrogate that we have uh, during cardiac arrest of cardiac output. It's an indir indirect parameter, of course, but it's non-invasive, readily available, and it, it, it has been established as a parameter that can inform us uh, about the effectiveness of, of, chest, uh, of chest compressions. In this case, in, uh, in agreement with this echocardiographic finding of inadequate chest compression depth, essentially, that we're appreciating here, so that left ventricle is not really adequately squeezed, even though we're compressing with a mechanical device, that is not generating adequate flow, and that's reflecting that entitled CO2 at the time of 11. So what we do here is we decided to switch out of that device and switch to manual compressions. As you can see, it's clear that this is manual compressions because there's a lot of more bouncing. It's a lot more irregular than, uh, com than compressions delivered by a mechanical device. And, in, and uh, as soon as we do that, entitled CO2 um, in the minute that follows improves to 24. We're able to actually tailor the depth of the chest compressions, um, in this case, while delivering manual CPR to optimally compress that left ventricle to a point that we were not able to reach um, in the sort of fixed uh, compression depth that we have established by a, a mechanical device in this case. And as we continue to uh, do this, optimizing the depth in this case of, this com of the compressions, the entitled CO2 uh, kept going up, as you can appreciate here, is visually better uh, quality of those compressions uh, as defined by better uh, and more uh, greater shortening of the diameter of that uh, left ventricle. And eventually we achieve ROSC. And so this is kind of a real time uh, assessment of uh, the quality of CPR that leads um, to an intervention, that intervention being switching from mechanical to manual CPR and optimizing the compression depth. Uh, so deviating from the one-size-fits-all uh, sort of recommendation from the guideline where all we have is uh, chest compression uh, rate and a sort of fixed rate uh, that is sort of population-based. And obviously in this individual case um, was not the most adequate. So in this case, you can see now the image on the left is the initial CPR and the image on the right is uh, the final sort of optimize CPR uh, with, with manual compression. So um, really uh, easy to understand, uh, I think, the impact in this case of this, of this intervention that follow the, uh, the finding uh, that was made with, with transesophageal echo in real time. And in addition to being able to identify cases where perhaps the compression depth is not enough, we have uh, the ability to actually identify cases where what we are hoping to do, which is to have blood eject uh, out of the left ventricle during the compression phase is actually not happening. And it's not happening in many cases because the area of maximal compression, the area that we're compressing the most with uh, CPR is actually obstructing the alpha tract. This is an example of a, a mid esophageal long axis image where compressions are obstructing the alpha tract. Is an example of uh, an image on the left where we have obstruction of the left ventricular alpha tract and the image on the right after having optimized, having uh, changed the position of the hands in order to not 
obstruct the outflow tract and try to optimize the squeeze of the left ventricle. So that'll be the before and after. This is um, a similar case where we were compressing the outflow tract and you can appreciate in the transgastric image here that the left ventricle actually is not changing its diameter, not changing really its, its volume, which means that we're not generating a change in pressure. In this case, um, it, the, the next question is, well, is there any data sort of supporting this mechanism? And the, the, the short answer is yes. There's been uh, at least two well-conducted uh, animal trials demonstrating essentially that when we compress the left ventricle, um, we obtain higher coronary perfusion pressures in that when we randomize swine to receive chest compressions over the LV, we get ROSC. And when we do standard chest compressions, in this case, obstructing the alpha tract in, in most cases uh, in this trial, we simply cannot get ROSC. This was confirmed by a more recent study that also evaluated uh, cerebral blood flow as a measure of obviously cerebral perfusion um, in a similar swine model, confirming the previous findings and, and this hypothesis that uh, obstruction of the left ventricle tract actually leads to worse hemodynamics in, uh, by means of lower uh, chest uh, coronary perfusion pressures, lower probability of ROSC. A study uh, back in 2009 actually had identified in an observational study the uh, the finding of compression of the left ventricle alpha tract happening in, in around 40 patients um, with out of hospital cardiac arrest. In in that study, they also the authors also correlated the actual uh, pl uh, precise location of that area of maximal compression um, with uh, the stroke volume, the estimated stroke volume in those patients, uh, depending on the position, the distance of the area of maximal compression from the aortic valve. And so the farther uh, of uh, that area of maximal compression into the left ventricle, farther away from the left ventricle, the, uh, the better stroke volume uh, that we obtain. So how common is this problem? Uh, according to uh, data from our group from 2019, this is actually quite common. We found 53% uh, of patients that had obstruction of the left ventricle for tract or, or aortic root uh, when evaluated with T doing a cardiac arrest. And the same year, a uh, study out of Italy confirmed that, uh, that for the first time, there was actually a link between that finding, the finding of an open LVOT with higher probability of uh, survival at 24 hours. So this is obviously very early data. Uh, in this case, this was retrospective, but uh, this supports the theory that when identified this phenomenon of abstraction of the alpha tract, we can intervene um, and potentially improve outcomes. Our group uh, in a collaboration through the resuscitative TE collaborative registry with uh, over 30 centers, uh, published last year at uh, the resuscitation symposium of AHA, the first study, multi-center study, demonstrating the link between the area of maximal compression, specifically obstruction of the alpha tract with the lower probability of ROSC. There is a, a study um, currently under uh, way to confirm um, this, these findings uh, in, in whether we can uh, not only uh, improve uh, or whether this finding is uh, associated with lower probability of ROSC, but uh, whether that actually also carries and in, in, uh, in, in is associated with lower um, survival to hospital discharge. Obviously, that's what we care about. Um, ultimately, in, uh, we're currently working to uh, evaluate that. For anybody who is interested in this topic and a more comprehensive review of it, um, I recommend this uh, sort of state of the review, state of the art review uh, published in Jack a couple of years ago uh, by our group, and uh, similarly in collaboration with our cardiac anesthesiology colleagues, uh, Andrea Denault and um, Dr. Bilok, we have uh, published. Uh, this in the Canadian Journal of Cardiology, another comprehensive review of the application of T specifically in cardiac arrest. Um, 
anybody who is interested uh, in joining this registry, this is an ongoing effort, multi-center uh, study at this point with 35 centers. We presented uh, the first analysis last year and, and, and this year uh, will be presented uh, additional data of the American Heart Association Resuscitation Symposium. Uh, if anybody's interested in joining this uh, ongoing work, uh, I highly um, uh, recommend uh, to, to check out uh, the, the website um, and reach out uh, to join. This is the work of many, uh, many individuals uh, around the country, in the U.S., Canada, and internationally that have, uh, that have collaborated, that have made this possible. Uh, and I want to acknowledge them because it is uh, only with uh, the help uh, of everybody who is uh, performing TEs in cardiac arrest that we can produce knowledge to learn uh, more about the impact um, of, of this modality. With that, I thank you for your attention. This is my email um, and I appreciate the invitation uh, to the, uh, the symposium. Thank you. Great lecture from Dr. Tran. And, uh, you know, TE is always the first thing we call for whenever there's an intraoperative arrest, mostly for diagnostic reasons. But it uh, would be great to to be able to also use it to evaluate the efficacy of compressions and, and the resuscitative efforts in, in order to optimize those things as well.